there's this general recognition that in order to close achievement gaps, we have to start looking at opportunity gaps. Uh, in part from an a equity, a, a moral standpoint, what kids should have, but increasingly because we know that some things can't be learned and can't necessarily be learned in school. That some things are best learned by trying and doing. So what are those things? So hopefully we can have a good discussion about that today. Um, I, I had, we took um, our state secretary of education, Paul Revel, on a site visit uh, to one of our summer learning programs. And um, he said, you know, in Massachusetts, we have some of the highest standards in the country. We've made improvement in schools at a faster rate than many other states in the country. And at this rate, we could probably close the achievement gap in two or 300 years. So that came from him, that was pretty powerful. And he was basically saying, how do we mobilize these efforts? Um, whether we like it or not, we operate in a competitive landscape and just follow the money and look at what's getting funded uh, and, and where <coughs> people with power and money think the solutions reside. I would argue that our two uh, biggest competitors to this collective approach that we've yet to define uh, are the single provider model that we can just expand what works to scale and that'll work for everyone and other silver bullets. Pick your silver, silver, silver bullet that if we just do this thing, it would solve it. And I think you know, we're about a more nuanced discussion and we're here together because we're trying to figure out a better way to communicate what we're doing to one another, to our counterparts in the schools or nonprofits, to policymakers and funders. And so uh, I, I realize that sitting there listening to any speaker for too long is deadly. So we'll, we'll practice what we preach. I'm going to break up the style here and show you a quick video um, and then come back to this question of how do we finish the sentence that schools can't do it alone. I just feel like these kids should have the same opportunity my own personal children had. And so I like the idea of having a summer program that wasn't school-based, that got kids outdoors doing things that they might not ordinarily do. There are waves, the boat will rock. So as you walk around, please make sure you're holding on to a rail. I've never been on a boat before, never been on a boat, and I almost thought I was going to throw up. The waves were big, the boat was jumping up and down. It was crazy. I'm like, we're going to die, we're going to die. <laughs> yeah, the, the part I missed the most was when I rode on the boat and got to Thompson Island. It feels way different than being in it Boston. It feels so good. It's Flag it in. So when you have something to say, you can just flag in. You put your arm out. We'll call on you. Be patient. Sometimes there's a lot of people that want to say something. Some of them um, are in SPED programs. Um, some of them had great deal of behavior issues last year. Am I going to have to speak to your mom today? I think I will. So you need because you're not you're, you're not being serious. Academically, we have the same high expectations of the students on the island that we do in the classroom. So I would find that my students were performing at the same level academically that we would expect of them in the school year. But the difference was in the ways they were able to engage with the content. And for some of our kids, there was a huge difference in behavior because they were able to be more active and be more hands-on throughout the course of our lessons and get the body movement in that they need to really have their energies focused during the learning time. Because on the first day, you get to rock climb. I'm not kidding on the first day. You get to rock climb. Can you hold on to the red one with your hand and then push your feet up? Summer learning is a, a different experience in terms of learning because you're not just 
behind a desk all day and in the same environment, like physical environment that they were in during the year, gives them a chance to learn from a different perspective over on the island. But at school, you have to sit down all day in a chair. At Thompson Island, you get to get up and walk outside and feel fresh air and breeze. Woo! Not a lot of our kids are exposed to nature on a regular basis, so it was really neat to be able to pull vocabulary words that connected to things we could see and experience together on the island, um, and it made it, again, much more authentic and meaningful for them. What's it called? It's called an anemometer. anemometer. They're more interested in hands-on, group-based learning, and they don't really want to just be sitting with their textbook and kind of being lectured. They like the group work and... Um, they ask more questions. 0 0.7. What? So if we have 2 and 0 0.7, does anyone know how to do an average? Having students calculate the mean, median, mode, and range in the classroom, it's so dry, it's so boring. And as their math teacher here and on the island, I got to see it all come alive. They were like, oh, this is what that means. So what's 2 reds equal? Plus 4. Sixteen, good. So she got sixteen. I see a lot of differences in academics, their math facts and their writing particularly. I have see huge improvements and gains certainly with my at-risk students academically. Whoa! 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 So I'm gonna empty them. Oh, oh, those are all gosh. fishes? Yeah. yeah, look at that. I wanna hold it's one. <laughs> its name is a Brooklyn Silver Slide. A brook silver side? Yeah. Nice. That looks so cool. So let's see if we can I we had a green crab in here. Woo! Woo! Let's see if you guys notice what is what it's That's missing from this one. Yeah. The, the, the claws. Yeah, oh the big ones. <laughs> I never got to touch a crab. And it was exciting because a lot of the kids who tend to think outside the box and are more creative thinkers and might often feel that that somewhat constricted by like a traditional classroom setting, we're really able to take ideas and like points of interest for themselves and really just run with them um, in a much more free way than you might normally be able to do on a given school day with more time constraints and um, more physical space constraints. So that was really cool. This is a horseshoe crab. Very good. And this one is another horseshoe crab with a tail. What stands out the most to me would definitely be how they're working in groups now and modeling to the students that didn't attend Thompson Island. I do see differences. It was really neat to see some kids step up into leadership roles who in the classroom wouldn't have normally taken on that role for themselves. It makes me a better student by helping me how to be a role model to other people and how to behave myself when I'm in a class or anywhere else. They look so different, it's like, who are they? <laughs> no, really, they came back in such great shape. And while all of them didn't go, enough of them went, that it's, make, it's having an impact on everybody. We made these papers and we wrote our fears for what we think, for fear, our fears for next year, for this year, and what we want to be better at this year. So um, it's actually, it actually, they said to throw away your fears and step up to the new things. Parents are pleasantly surprised. I mean, I'm talking about kids who they receive phone calls regularly from third grade teachers last year and from second year grade teachers the year before. These were kids that had many challenges. And there's something about what happened this summer that has made a difference for these kids, both in school and at home. It will change their lives in many ways. It'll, they'll learn different experience about stuff that they don't even know. It helped them a lot. What time is it? Let me get it. The ant went right through it. It says no. Oh, ew. And what I mostly loved about Thompson Island 
was <laughs> what? the cafeteria. Because they have amazing food. Oh my god, you can annoy me here, alright? They have amazing food. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I can say this a thousand times. Amazing food. It's, um. They had this big, big buffet. There's delicious food like spaghetti, rice. They had pizza and stuff like that. I, don't, yeah, I didn't spaghetti. really like garlic bread, but I like theirs. I told one friend that there was a buffet there and he was mad. We got to eat chicken nuggets with salad. We got to eat tacos. Chicken parmesan. What is that? It's delicious. Buffet. Let me just say, I stole the idea of doing a video from Providence. They had a, a video last summer, and it was just so effective in communicating what we're about and finishing that sentence, schools can't do it alone. Um, I, the other thing about that video, one, it was being edited two days ago, so our videographer burned the midnight oil so that we could show it today. Um, but because I did such a poor job scheduling, we basically walked into the schools last week and wanted to interview kids, teachers, and the principal. We didn't stage any of it. These were it was very authentic. So we tried to go for more of a, documentar a documentary feel, uh, less of a scripted promotional video. And uh, you know that principal has very high standards and frankly is skeptical of a lot of these efforts. And that, that was the most meaningful part to me to hear how she reflected on it. Uh, the other thing is really interesting. I, I'm sure you've, you all have programs that look like that here. Um, I think we have to get away from calling that innovative. I mean, it's, it's common sense at some level. What the, the Secretary of Education said is, I was trying to sell them on the measures and you know, who the students were and how we're integrating the academics and the enrichment. And he said, yeah, 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 I hear you. He said, but I've been sending my kids to programs like that their entire lives. Uh, the issue is really access. Who gets, to, who gets to experience that? And how do we know when we've reached those kids? Um, because in, in our world, um, kids pretty much self-select into programs, which is a wonderful thing on one hand, but you know, we estimate there are probably 40% of the kids who arguably need this kind of intervention program most never find their way. So that, that's one of the main challenges. Um, I'll come back to the summer because that was, that's really our laboratory for learning. That's where we're testing out our measures of non-academic outcomes. Um, you can see it, so how do we describe it and how do we measure it? Um, and largely what you see here is this simple math equation. What we say is schools can't do it alone. You need community partners. Um, and we have a, a rich array in Boston from the arts to sports to expeditionary learning to service learning uh, to everything in between. And, um, and on the school side, uh, we recognize that, okay, you have fundamental challenges here. Can we address them together? You're measured on them. You're funded on them. How can we work together around them? So we came away with the recognition that, yes, academics matter. Uh, mastering the content matters. Succeeding in school matters. Credentials matter. We work with an economist at Northeastern University, Andy Sum in Boston, who says that dropping out of high school is like, is the equivalent of committing economic suicide. And now with the big focus on unemployment numbers, just they correlate to education rates, it's, uh, to educational attainment. So we recognize that we have a fundamental challenge to get th kids through school to succeed. At the same time in this discussion, we recognize that community organizations bring resources as far as staffing, approach, expertise, often private funding. So the challenge before us is, okay, how do we deploy these together? So I wanna talk just a, a minute about our role in this and um, see if some of the challenges resi resonate. Uh, we're basically about bringing together this vast system. In Boston, we have 700 plus nonprofits working in schools. And those are just the ones we know about who are in our, our central database. Uh, we have 140 schools. We have uh, several foundations. We have several intermediaries. I mean, in Boston, 
the issue is more coordination than supply of services or programs. Uh, so what we try to do is uh, put our arms around these in a, a way that allows us to see the same issues in the same ways and to use the same language. And I, and I really do, I can't emphasize enough, I think language and vocabulary really matter to having one conversation. So this idea of an intermediary, which frankly was a threat when we were founded in 2005, is to bring uh, some focus to these stakeholders so that we develop the same goal, shared goals, shared measures, and maybe even shared accountability. And that sounds great and it looks great on a slide that's really hard to implement. And I know that's some of the challenge that faces uh, Sprockets and Youth Prize and, and others. How do you fit into the system? What are the benefits for you if you're a program provider? Well, why do you want to be a part of something that looks like this or a school? Um, and I'll just tell you the, the, the challenges I faced. I started three years ago in this role. Prior to that, I did work with businesses at a, a, it was a workforce board, the Boston Private Industry Council, where we brokered jobs for high school kids. Um, but when I came to Boston After School and Beyond, uh, instead of working with businesses who bring resources to the table, we were working with this uh, nonprofits who require money. Different, similar in some ways, very different on the resource front. Uh, and what I noticed, just to give you two stark examples, I tried to get to know the schools better and what they thought of after school and tried to get to know after school better. Uh, I'll start with after school. I talked to somebody who's managing a program. I said, okay, well, what do these programs do? And she said, um, homework and recreation. Uh, I said, well, what, what do you mean, home what kind of homework? What subject? Yeah, homework, homework and recreation. She couldn't go beyond homework and recreation. And I talked to the schools. They s had basically the same idea. It's homework and recreation. So there, there was a... And, and they were just talking past each other, never beyond homework and recreation. When the truth was, the programs are doing a lot more than homework and recreation, but many of them were describing themselves that way. Uh, so our approach is um, we don't really have any, uh, there, there are lots of parallels, I said. We grew out of the mayor's office in a philanthropic collaborative and then the authority of the mayor went away and the money went away and they created us as the intermediary. So we don't have any formal authority. Uh, we do have some regranting funds. So our approach starts with relationships and really networking to some degree, getting to know, that's our, that's our core competency. We know the needs and objectives of those major segments, the mayor's office, the schools, the nonprofits and philanthropy. They each give me a fraction of their time, maybe 5%. I think about them 100% of my time. Um, so what we try to do is to bring them together through demonstration projects so that everyone has some skin in the game, everyone shares the same understanding of what they're trying to accomplish, and in doing so, develop proof points. And for things that work, the big goal now is how do we, how do we sustain them, how do we make them part of the primary system. Because even on our best day, a demo, you know, this summer demonstration project, there's almost $3 million in private funds. There are 1,500 kids, which is the same size as the traditional summer school. It felt great for a minute. And then we said, God, that's only 1,500 kids in one summer. How do we keep this going? Back to the secretary's point, you know, this, how, do you, how do you make this part of the way things look all the time? So that's our challenge. Um, I know there's a variety of uh, players in the audience. Um, I think you know, each, th the idea is that each of us plays to our strengths. We don't subordinate what we do to be part of this collective effort, but that the collective effort enables us to play to our strengths. And I think the conditions matter a lot. And we're fortunate in Boston to have a cradle to career agenda that's mainly driven by philanthropy but includes the Boston Public Schools and the mayor. So two-thirds of my job was done here in articulating this cradle-to-career pipeline where generally they um, 
embrace the same goals on, on school readiness. Uh, they've basically adopted the superintendent's goals and the, they're really benchmarks, third grade reading, eighth grade algebra, on track for graduation. Um, they culminate in high school success. Um, we, we had a, a major breakthrough a couple of years ago, actually my former employer, the Private Industry Council, working with the economist I mentioned, was able to track the college success rates of Boston Public Schools graduates. So we tracked 98% of the class of 2000. We didn't have to extrapolate. We actually knew where they went to school and, what, and, and, and uh, whether or not they finished college. We used, I'm sure you've heard of the, uh, the National Student Clearinghouse. They collect all this information. We worked with colleges to get them to submit their enrollment information. So now we can actually say what happens to our kids. And it's a great frame, I think, for the OST field in Boston because we now know that of the kids who graduate, um, about two-thirds go on to a two, -year, two or four-year college, and 35.5% of them actually finish within seven years. So that gives us a big goal we can all aim for. Um, and it also shows this, you know, in, in, in competing with our competitors, the silver bullet, nobody, nobody has the silver bullet. Only a third of the kids who graduate and go to college actually finish. If you multiply that by the ratio of kids who actually finish high school, you know, for some subpopulations, you're down to under one in 10 kids, one in 10 freshmen actually finish in college. So nobody has all the answers as far as I've seen. So we, th this, sh this should be wide open to looking at what works. Um, so now that you have a sense of sort of our position where Sprockets are youth prize in Boston, this context, which is this cradle to career aspiration with some actually pretty good measures in, in place, outcomes, checkpoints, how many kids graduate, how many go on to college. Um, now I wanna talk about how we actually have begun to mobilize the out of school time community in coordination with, in collaboration with the Boston Public Schools to serve kids in the way that you saw in that video. And I think the process matters. Uh, so we started with a, a it was a, basically a group like this. I mean, we, we talked to mostly program providers. We talked to some parents and teachers, we talked to some foundation folks. We had all sorts of stakeholder groups, did uh, hundreds of interviews and surveys. And we said, what do you do? What do you do in after school? And what skills do you help kids develop? And how do you measure, what's fair for you to be measured on? We asked basically the same questions Dale put up. And the process mattered because we went with what the field said, and this is what they said. They said, we help kids achieve, connect, and thrive. And this is like uh, learning contributor and navigator, slightly different language, same point. Um, and the answers I'd say were the same. Yeah, well, while we're, we care about academic outcomes, can we link our intervention to it? Maybe not directly, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're helping them be successful in school to achieve. We're helping them develop good relationships, the sort of classic youth development. Um, and we're helping them thrive. There's something about self-belief, motivation, grit. Yeah, we help do that too. Um, in a subsequent survey, we asked uh, program providers which of these areas they focused on. You know, seven, eight, nine, nine out of 10 focus on these areas. And we asked them, how many of these skills do you measure? And it was two or three out of 10. So there, there were not a lot of good measures around this. Um, so the important point here is this came from the field. Um, this is generally well received. I mean, anytime I'm in a group, an, audi uh, uh, an audience in Boston, head start nodding when we go through this. It doesn't feel like this guy from this intermediary is telling me what we do or what we should care about. Um, and this was basically the strategic framework. I, I'm, 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 I get impatient with academic or conceptual conversations. So, but this was really helpful in devising the summer learning project that you saw in the video and raising money for it because people saw, okay, this is what the after school programs do. And we took this to the next level. We said, okay, 
these are good, these are interesting domains, but what skills actually matter? I'm, I'm counting on there being a few extroverts in the audience. So let me let me pose this question. What skills matter to your success at work now? What are some of those skills? Communication. Reliability. Reliability. Organization, flexibility. Two more. Creativity, strategic thinking. All right. So we basically took this concept and asked those questions and consulted. Uh, I, I hope all this stuff's open source. We looked at the Search Institute's 40 developmental assets. We looked at for the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. Um, we looked at the SEO and the PQ. We looked at all this stuff and said, okay, what is this getting at? And that helped us fill out this fan or this peacock, whatever you want to call it. This is the ACT framework. And these are the, these are the skills we've, start, we've started to focus on and started naming them. Okay, how does communication matter? Um, the way I look at this framework, one, there are too many skills listed there. They may not quite be in the right domain, but they're enabling us to have a discussion and a shared vocabulary. But the way I think about it is achieving is how you relate to a task or an objective, setting a goal, getting organized. These are your executive function skills. Connecting is about how you relate to others, to peers, and to adults. And thriving is about how you relate to yourself. And I'd put grit, resilience in that category. And that these are the skills, fundamentally, that enable you to succeed in school, but as you've just said, allow you to succeed in, in life as well, work and life. School, college, work and life. And this was, this was the breakthrough at the schools. From saying, are, th there's 700 nonprofits, and they do homework and recreation, to, oh, they help kids set goals, this is why they, they'll pay attention in school. It helps them navigate. I like your language, by the way, learner, contributor, navigator. Th this is what's behind it. Okay, we, we see that now, we value that. Um, but still, we don't quite know how to measure that. And I'll get to measuring that, but I, I do think this sequence of conversations is, is, is important. Um, and my favorite example is when a, a program goes from saying, you know, I do, um, arts on Tuesdays and Thursdays after school um, and from that you know and you press and, and kids learn to to organize themselves and think creatively and, and work with their friends and you get the program description which is wonderful but you have to realize that funders and policymakers the people who matter to the longevity of your program hear that a hundred or in our case 700 times over and they can't keep it straight but when a program flips that and says, we develop communication skills, relationship skills, and uh, teamwork skills through the arts after school for these kids, it just helps elevate the conversation to what the, the, the outcome is. And you say, oh, that's what you do. How do you do that? Oh, that's how the arts work. And instead of leading with the content. So that's my second opinion. You know, my first is, let's not call this innovative, it's common sense. The second is, while the content is really interesting as a hook, it confuses policymakers. I was uh, on that same, we, we really milked this summer project. We brought out the House co-chair of the Education Committee, the state level legislative leader, and we took her on the boat to the island, and she said, now, I often get approached by, you know, Bell and citizen schools and and YMCA's and Boys and Girls Clubs, and she named five others off the top of her head. It seems like they're all sort of independent and have their own goals and do their own things. Now, how, do they ever work together? And it was just, it was the perfect question. It actually allowed me to explain what we do as an intermediary. And the answer was, that's precisely it. They do different things. And you know what? They're really good at what they do and you want that kind of variety. And what's really powerful is when you can link that to what kids want to do, and then you set the same standards. So there's flexibility and implementation in how they reach kids. We need a lot more of that, clearly. Only a third of the kids who graduate and go to college are actually graduating. 
but consistency and evaluation. How do you know who's doing what well? I think she actually got that. And I think that's, that's the same discussion that we have with schools all the time. Um, I know I'm contradicting myself. I, I don't like conceptual frameworks, but we had to deal with one. The, the schools were saying, okay, I, I hear you on all this act stuff. I, I kind of get it now, but you know, we're in turnaround mode. We have to accelerate learning and hit these test scores. Um, and, and we're gonna, I feel like this was sort of meeting halfway. Th this to me was the big opening in Boston. They had these two triangles. One is academics. The other is social emotional. This is how we're going to intervene with kids. And so at the bottom of the peri uh, pyramid is what all kids need and it, it just, it, it goes up from there. Um, so we have these tiers of intervention. And they said, now, how does that ACT framework map against this? So that's when we just got creative and drew a circle around it. So clearly there's a circle around this. But we were able to make the case again that these are the skills that enable position kids to succeed in school, to motivate them, engage them, keep them focused. And this is the last conceptual framework. Um, the big opening here was they actually got that. They got these skills, you know, th they're going deep on what kids need from a social emotional point of view in order to influence their academic success. And I think the big opening here for people like us is that developing those skills, those ACT skills, the ones we name, I think requires practice, it requires doing, and you can only do so much of that within the confines of a school. I mean, schools can't do it alone. Teachers can't do it alone. They have a scope and sequence of the curriculum they have to go through. They're in a building. They can't go on a boat. How do they do that? It requires, it necessitates the involvement of partners who bring those skills, the expertise, the manpower, and funding. And their approach matters. They get kids ready to learn after school and during the summer, and they give them opportunities to practice or exercise those skills. So this isn't just a nice to have or, you know, I, I feel like I should say the right thing and say, yeah, I believe in after school and summer. This is now critical to achieving those school goals. And it requires partners. And truthfully, it really raised the stakes for partners. What do they bring in? How are they bringing it? And how do they know it's working? And we're actually getting a lot, a lot deeper in that work now in Boston with uh, several turnaround schools. So these are the lowest performing schools. These are very mature, sophisticated principals. They get the idea that you need partners in order to reach those school goals. And, and frankly, n none of this is new. We, we've done this before in fits and starts. This kind of visibility is really important. Principals are saying, okay, let's bring this partnership stuff in. Tell us how to measure it. We wanna hold them account. We wanna, one, inform the interventions with kids. We want to be able to personalize education. We want to hold the partners accountable. If they want in this education game, they're going to share my goals because guess what? I could get fired next year if I don't meet them. So, you know, that, in my opinion, that was a risk worth taking. Let's be part of the same game. So Summer gave us a great opportunity to do this. Uh, th you know, I would say that's, that's the other lesson here is just to, you know, Pick a place that you can own. This was basically a white space. Nobody, culturally, we found nobody in schools really had any idea what kids were doing over the summer. There were very few uh, efforts to really intentionally link kids to the right fit over summer. There's no data coming back on what they did over the summer, let alone on summer learning loss. I mean, it's always shocking to me that if, if you know, you've seen the statistic, I'm sure, that up to two-thirds of the achievement gap can be explained by uneven access to quality summer learning. That if that's where kids fall behind, and it's cumulative, so they fall further and further behind every year, and it's dispro it disproportionately affects certain kids, low-income kids, I mean, to me, that feels like low-hanging fruit. I don't know why we don't think more about it. Uh, but we're starting to. And I'm, I'm not gonna read what's here, but th this was our vision. Uh, again, as important as, as what it says is how we got there. Uh, 
this is the value of collaboration. I, I'm not a big fan of conceptual frameworks. I don't like sitting in meetings either, but this is a great product from sitting in meetings. We came up with this together. Funders own it, the schools own it, the nonprofit providers who participated own it as well. And all it says is that, okay, we're gonna get focused. Um, we're gonna use summer to get kids ready for the next grade level and to develop those act skills. And we're gonna do it in ways, because we can, that are hands-on, engaging, project-based. These are all things, by the way, teachers want to do given the time and flexibility. So we're not gonna add time or flexibility for its own sake. I often feel like we talk about that as an agenda unto itself, more time, more autonomy, and we don't think about why. Why? Because it, it we need more time and more flexibility and partners in order to reach kids the way we want to reach them. So you've, you've seen the scale. I just want to emphasize how much um, in the early going this requires collaboration. Uh, we have lots of partners here uh, for good reason. I'll just say a, just a quick bit of the rationale in these partners. The schools, we went for the lowest performing schools we could find. We wanted to take on the greatest need with the schools and really share the school's problems. Uh, the partners, we looked at ones who were really serious about summer learning and who wanted to be part of the system. They wanted to opt into the system. They don't have to, but they choose to. And my favorite partners in here are the ones, um, you can see the ones on the top row. These are uh, mostly cultural organizations. They're neighborhood based. Uh, they're gonna be there beyond when the principal is. The second row, these are, these are community assets. This is the island, the reservation, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, the center. These are places, and these are serving as satellite extended education enterprises for the Boston Public Schools. In the bottom row, these are service providers, so they're nimble, they can go in a great many places. But we're developing together this kind of integrated learning system. Uh, the bottom row are the, the funders and uh, my, my, the final point here, which is the, uh, the measures, the non-academic measures. Um, we worked with a group called PEAR. Uh, Gil Nome runs it. Um, they're out of, out of Harvard, and, and they developed an instrument called the Holistic Student Assessment that really gets at social-emotional growth. Uh, the Achievement Network to get the academic standards identified. Um, Rand and, and the National Institute on Out-of-School Time are the evaluators. NIOST there actually developed the SEO, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second, uh, to look at skill gain. So there's a lot going on here. I haven't answered that question. Schools can't do it alone. I haven't finished that in a concise way uh, because we're getting lots of partners engaged in the question together. Um, so what we, what we basically said is, okay, what if we could look at kids as individuals and programs in this sort of scorecard way where we look at academic power standards, we look at the skills that are consistent with success in school, work, and life. We look at social, emotional needs and strengths. And we look at the management, the, the structure of these partnerships. And what you get is something that looks like this. You can see those data points that most importantly inform the interventions. So you know where kids are struggling academically, what they need to learn. Uh, that upper right quadrant is the result of the SEO tools. You can see some of these skills. We're heading toward this notion of what are the power skills that complement power standards? What are the most meaningful skills in that framework? We can't talk about 16 different skills. Um, the ones we happened to choose in the summer were engagement and learning, uh, communication and relations with adults. So you can actually observe and measure growth in those areas. The bottom left, this is the pair assessment. I know you, I know you can't read this. Um, but these are looking at resiliencies like trust, optimism, empathy, motivation, academic motivation. Uh, these are the skills that help you personalize the intervention. And this has been incredibly useful for teachers who they, they see a certain kind of behavior, they pull up the sheet and they say, okay, this kid is actually highly motivated academically but has poor peer relationships that suggests a certain way of interacting with them. And you can see what the chart shows you there is how one individual compares to the rest of the group. 
So you can look at organizing group dynamics and individual interventions. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but you know, this was really helpful to come out of last summer, not just with academic results, because people want to say, did it work? You know, we weren't trying to prove that summer learning works. There have been big national studies on that. Um, but we did want to elevate these skills. So we were able to show that, hey, these, these, these skills are actually strongly correlated to one another. And that we saw differences in programs. So some are really good at some of these skills. Some programs are better than others. Uh, the other thing I'll say, this is the last, this is the SAO, the Survey of After School Youth Outcomes. This is required by the state 21st century grants. So tens of thousands of kids have been observed on this tool. That enabled us to compare how our kids did compared to the statewide group. Um, and we could break it down by skill area. So those first two bars did something really special with kids, not only in engagement and learning, but on communication and relationships with adults. So we expanded both of those this summer. Um, the other ones we had to look at, what, what did contribute to that? Was it, was it attendance? Was it the staffing structure? What about those sites didn't get the gains that we wanted to see? So it's giving us information not to punish and reward, but to talk about what's working and what's not. And again, just back to this, this pair assessment. Um, you know, th this is what, I, what we hope will inform that social emotional triangle that the Boston Public Schools uses. You know, we, we, we know lots about their academic performance. What do we know about where they stand socially and emotionally? And that when you can put these together, they mean a lot. The final measure here is these are what kids think about their program on these characteristics, engaging, challenging, um, supportive adults. Uh, this, is, this is really interesting. And this tends to correlate with the, the observable skills. So you know, back to that scorecard, we're going to have a picture, a big Excel sheet. For each kid, we'll have academics, social emotional growth, skill gain, and what they thought about the program. And I'm not going to spend much time on this, but you know, what, gets <coughs> what gets measured gets done. Um, there's off, uh, obviously a lot of work that has to happen behind the scenes to get, to get consents, to actually, how, how do you actually share data on this between schools and nonprofit partners? And you know, w w the, the areas we're working with, and I'm sure Carrie and I have a lot in common, are you know, the, the barriers around data, technology, policy, and, and legal. And so that's kind of the, the work of the intermediary, pulling that together across sectors so that we can have uh, one conversation about kids and actually get access to the data, which can be tricky. Uh, we have a set of policy recommendations that are coming out because uh, this does have to, happen, have to happen every year for those kids, not just episodically. And where we're going next, and um, we, we have to do this together for it to be meaningful. Uh, Elizabeth is going to talk about a national collaboration that we're a part of, um, CBAS. But we're trying to get to this notion of power skills. So beyond the point that social emotional outcomes matter too, but to, okay, which ones and why and for, for which age groups? And how do these different content areas help do this? How do arts and sports and leadership programs, you know, how, how is your difference a strength, whether you're at a YMCA or a Boys and Girls Club? And we're trying to link those to what you know, the establishment cares about. The Common Core is coming down the road. Again, a great opportunity. We're talking not just about content, but about skills. And so we're trying to map the ACT framework for the Common Core um, to, to college success. Uh, Kari mentioned that the study about grit, you know, it, closing the achievement gap isn't enough for success in college. Apparently, it requires these other skills to get through. And then finally, to success in, in um, in, uh, in careers, and I cite the new basic skills, Dick Bernane at Harvard. I mean, it's just a, a great um, discussion about what matters now in today's economy. What skills do you do you matter? <laughs>